Y'all know what's going on. It's time for another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker. Welcome to the show, y'all. We're going to check this out, y'all. Now, look. Now, Melissa, you know, she left Jason. And Corey's in the penitentiary with 30-plus years. You know what I'm saying? Because Jason testified against him. Y'all know about all that, right? So now, Melissa's got to figure out what she's going to do because she's about to have a baby. So she's standing at her parents' house, and they're comforting her. They're letting her know that they're going to be there for her in every way that they need to be. You know what I'm saying? This is their daughter, and they got a grandbaby on the way. And they're going to love that child no matter what. And the situation is what it is, okay? Now, Melissa's situation is like a lot of women when they get with a dope boy or somebody in the streets. Now, remember that, right? Because a lot of times, you know, women don't think about, you know, putting up some money for themselves and all this. And they're living in the moment because dude, whoever it is, is giving them this money. They got the car. They got the jewelry. They're taking the trips and all this and that. But what about your future? What about your future? And if you're having the children, what about their future? Because the fact of the matter is simply this, right? If you're dealing with a dope boy, nine times out of ten, jail or prison is in that person's future. That's simply that. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? I'm not going to condone any of the things that they do, but look here. You better be putting you some money up. You better be planning on the day that they're going to jail. It's as simple as that because it's coming. Because most dope boys don't quit. Remember that. They don't quit the game. They're usually forced to stop. Think about it. How many do you know that have retired from the game? Yeah, I know they'll take some, a lot of them will take their money and they'll buy this business or that business or whatever the case may be, but they usually keep those businesses afloat with the dope money. They're not actually committed to the business. They think because they can sell dope that they can run a business. To an extent, that is true, but it's slightly different because it requires you to convince your clientele to buy whatever product or service that, you, that you're selling them. And this is not dope. Dope sells itself. If you're running a business, you got to convince people that what you're doing is more beneficial to them than the person down the street. You understand what I'm saying? It's not about who got that, the, the best dope. So anyway, she's got to continue with that because now she doesn't really have any income. And she's taking, uh, her parents are taking care of her. And now she's got another child. She's got a child on the way and another mouth to feed. So now she's thinking about that. So she's thinking about her future. So she's doing like a lot of people. She's looking online, trying to find a job. She's trying to find something she can do after she has the baby. So she has the baby. She has a beautiful little girl. Beautiful little girl, right? A beautiful little girl. Now she's really thinking about, I don't want my daughter to go through what I've gone through. She's thinking about what she's going to do to make sure that this child of hers has the best life. So initially, because she don't want to, you know what I'm saying? Keep the child away from Jason. She tells him, you know, and he comes around. He gives her money every now and then, but it's sparingly and it's not consistent. You know what I'm saying? And the reason he's doing that is because he's really mad. He wants her to come back, but she's not coming back. So he's using the money to bait her. Give her some money. Tell her to come back and everything going to be good. She's not falling for it. She's stronger than that. She's smarter than that. She's not doing it. Because she's done. He has shown her that he's not the type of person that can be trusted. He has to show her that, but he's not doing that. He wants to continue to do what he's doing, and she don't want her daughter in that. So she says, okay, I got to give me a job. And she sees a commercial on TV about working in a prison. Never in her life would she imagine that she would be a part of something like that. But she sees it and she thinks that I can do that. She's graduated from high school. You feel what I'm saying? She wants to go to college somewhere down the line. In the meantime, in between time, she's staying with her parents. And her parents have told her, you can stay here as long as you want. They love the fact that she's there because they get to spend all the time they want with their granddaughter. They're retired. They got, they're straight. And they said, as long as they have a house, she has a house. So she's not going to have to pay any rent. They want her to stay there, save her money until she gets straight, and then she can move out. But there's no rush. No rush, no pressure, no nothing. They love her there. So she says, okay, 
I'm going to fill out an application for the prison. Her daddy is suspicious. He doesn't like it because he thinks about all the stories that he's heard about prison and, and, and he doesn't want his daughter in the middle of that. And the mother is more concerned than the father because she's looking at it like that's not a place, you know what I'm saying, that she would want her daughter. But they all sat down and talk and she said, look, I'm going to be okay. I'm a big girl. And if it's not something that I like, I'm going to quit. And then I'll find something else. But right now, this is the best thing that I can do. The hours are flexible for her. She's already talked to him and they told her, look, we can make sure that you get on first shift. And all of those types of things that make it sound good, okay? They do that. You know what I mean? So she goes and fills out the application and they tell her, you got to go through training. And you're going to be away from home for a few weeks. So she tells her parents that and she's never been away from her daughter overnight. So she goes through a lot of stress with that, trying to make the decision, and she finally makes the decision to do it. But she calls every night to talk to her daughter, even though her daughter really don't uh, understand what she's saying. and all, Well, she understands what she's saying, I'm sure, but she can't talk back. She's not at that age yet where she can formulate sentences and all this and that, right? But her daughter recognizes her voice, and she gets excited every time the phone rings. You know what I'm saying? She, she thinks that's her mama. So she goes through the training. She comes home. She's fine. She's got her uniform. She's got her shift. And now she's finna start working. She's finna start working. And she gets a job. She gets a post. So they take her to the prison. She's going through OJT. And she's learning all the ins and outs, the do's and don'ts of being an employee in corrections. And they're walking through the prison. And they're learning and they're teaching and all this. And she's not the only one. It's a class of It's a group of them, men and women, that have gone through the academy with her. And they're walking through the prison. And lo and behold, guess what? She sees Corey. Now, they had asked her at the academy, like they do all of the cadets, is there anybody that you know or related to in prison? We need to know that. You know what I'm saying? And she didn't even think to tell them about Corey. She had no idea what prison she was going to work in. She just wasn't thinking that, you know, she would see Corey. But when she saw him, she was startled. And he looked at her, and she looked at him, and... Just out of instinct, I would imagine, Corey put his his hand up to his lip like this, like simulating to her, don't say anything. She caught it. She's always been fond of Corey, you know what I'm saying, as a friend, as a brother. So she kept walking and didn't say a thing. Didn't say a thing. And for whatever reason, she almost felt relieved that she saw somebody in the prison that she knew. She felt relieved by that. Because they had told them all the stories in, in the academy about what it's like to work in prison, where you can't trust the people in prison. They're all trying to get something from you. They're going to manipulate, use you. They're liars and all of this and that. And when she saw Corey, she remembered that Corey was a good dude. He was just in the streets. He was trying to get his money, but Corey was a good dude. So she felt relieved. It was like, ooh, somebody that I know. You know what I'm saying? So she went on and did her training in the OJT. And lo and behold, she ends up working in the unit that Corey is housed in. And like a lot of uh, 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 new uh, employees that get it, especially women, you have a lot of the guys, they're running down and they're trying to talk or pretend that they need something so they get a couple of minutes to say what they say, hoping that it's enough that the person will be like, yeah, I like him. You know what I'm saying? All this and that, right? But... So Corey, he waits, he buys his time. He buys his time and he sees an opportunity. She's down at the desk filling out paperwork. And she had been wondering, you know what I'm saying, after three or four days, why he hadn't said anything to her. So he makes his way down there and he speaks. He said, look, first thing I know, he said, hey, how you doing? Don't tell anybody that you know me. Before she can get a word out of her mouth, he says that. Don't tell anybody that you know me. And she said, okay. She looked at him. She said, how are you doing? He said, I'm doing I'm good. He said, how are you? She said, I'm fine. She said, you know, I got a little girl. And he was like, congratulations, you know what I'm saying, and happy for you and all this. And she told him that her little daughter's name was Robbie. You know what I'm saying? And she uh, said, I'll show you some pictures one day if I get a chance and all this. And he said, okay, cool, whatever the case may be. And she looked at him. She said, I'm sorry. She said, he told me that he wasn't going to do that. And, and Corey looked at it, he said, like, look, it's good. I'm straight. 
I'm fighting it. See what happens. You know what I'm saying? And he said, really, it's still at 30%. So I just got a few more years and I get a chance to get out. And she was excited by this. She said, really? And uh, he was like, yeah. See, she didn't know how it worked and he didn't know how it worked. You know, getting 30 some years in the court, when you think you got 30 years. You think you're going to be gone for 30 years. But when you get to the prison, they tell you how much you got to do and all of this whole kind of stuff when you get your time sheet. And time sheet is basically a breakdown of all the time that you have and the, and the good days and the, and the days that you're going to earn for good behavior and all that. And it gives you this estimated data when you might have a chance of getting out. And Corey's was after he did 10 plus years, he would have an opportunity to get out. So he wasn't in such a bad situation for all the things that he had done, if that makes any sense to you. So they're talking about that and all this and that. Now everybody's watching because that's how it is in prison. People watch everything. So you're not going to do anything that somebody's not going to be able to see. There's no such thing as privacy in the penitentiary, not even when you're using the restroom, not even when you're taking a shower. No. They may not actually be able to see you in the shower. They may not actually be able to see you using the restroom, but somebody's looking always at the door when you cover it up. Somebody's watching that. Hmm, wonder what he's doing. Sometimes the officer might come around and knock on the door. What are you doing in there? So you're never alone, alone, ever. So he knew that people were watching him. He said, like, look, I can't stay down here that long. I'll talk to you again in a couple of days, something like that. If you need anything, let me know. If anybody says anything out of the way to you, let me know. I'll see what I can do about it, this and that and that. He gave her some do's and don'ts and certain people that she should mess with, certain people that she shouldn't talk to, and all this and that. He said, I got you. She could tell that prison had matured him in a way that he wasn't on the streets. She was looking at a grown man now. She saw him as a grown man now. She didn't see him as her brother like she used to. She saw him as a grown man, somebody that was holding his own, accepting responsibility for the, for what he did, and he's standing on his own two feet. And she liked it. She liked it. She was proud of him. She was proud of him. Proud of him. Now, here's the thing. On her way home, she's wondering, Man, do I say anything to anybody about seeing Corey? And she didn't. She decided not to. She didn't tell anybody. She didn't tell her parents. She didn't tell Jason or anything. Now, she talked to, talked to her baby about everything. You know what I'm saying? That was her confidant. But Robbie was her confidant. And she talked to Robbie about everything. But Robbie couldn't say anything about it. She couldn't respond. But you know how it is when you're talking to your baby. You know, and it wasn't like she was wanting to be with Corey or anything like that. She was just happy that he was OK. She was just happy that he was OK. But Jason, because he was still in the streets, he was hearing that she had a job at the prison. So out of curiosity, he decided to figure out, find out where she was working. He did. And was Corey there? And he was. So he confronted her one day. He confronted her one day. He saw her out and about, and he said to her, he said, like, I heard you're working at the prison where Corey's at. She looked at him and didn't say anything. And she said, look, leave me alone. We're done. There's nothing left. You know what I'm saying? Nothing left, and there's not going to be anything. He said, okay. And he went on about his business. But the problem with that is this. She felt like that he could probably get her in trouble. So when she goes back to work, she talks to Corey. She tells Corey that Jason said something to her about working at the prison and he's there. And Corey told her, he said, that could get you in trouble. That could get me shipped or it could get you fired. Either way, it's not good. You know what I'm saying? So that concerned them. But they were like, look, we'll just wait to see what happened. Because, you know, Corey, he was starting to solidify his reputation as being a stand-up dude. And in the penitentiary, you know what I'm saying? That's that's kind of like where you can really solidify your reputation in the penitentiary and the streets. So people that were coming in and out of the prison, they started to talk about Corey, how he was different than he was on the streets. He wasn't a violent person on the street, but he had gotten the reputation of being somebody that could be, that would stand up in the penitentiary, right? So now that he, his whole reputation is being rounded out, he's not somebody to be taken lightly. So the streets were starting to respect him in a way that they didn't before. You know what I'm saying? So now he makes some calls and he asked some guys that he had befriended in the penitentiary. Look, 
I mean, tell dude to stand down, man. Ain't nobody playing with him. You know what I'm saying? Keep it moving, right? Now, Corbett had a different understanding, you know what I'm saying, of what the streets was really about because in the penitentiary, snitches do get stitches. You understand what I'm saying? Now, it's the same on the streets when you whoever got that bag and all this net, right? But there are more occasions in the penitentiary where you're going to get smacked in your mouth for going against the code than it is on the streets. You feel what I'm saying? So he thought that he would be able to get somebody on the streets to deal with Jason if it came down to it, but he couldn't. And here's why. Let me explain to you why. If you want to get somebody dealt with in the penitentiary on the streets, it's going to cost you. The people that are going to be putting in the work want to know how does it benefit me, right? They want to know how it's going to benefit them. If it's not going to benefit them, they're not going to do it. They don't care nothing about no code. It's about how does it benefit them. Remember that, y'all. Remember that, okay? So, Corey and Melissa, they're getting real close, real close. I'm telling you, real close. And Melissa is starting to develop feelings for Corey that she never had before. Now, keep in mind, she hasn't been with anybody since before uh, she, you know, when she was with Jason. Nobody. Nobody. And she hadn't even played with that thing. You feel what I'm saying? She hadn't even played with that thing even after she gave birth or nothing. She just hadn't thought about it. It's not something that, you know what I'm saying, that it crossed her mind to want to be with anybody or to even satisfy herself. You know what I'm saying? But now that she was seeing Corey, now that she was seeing Corey at the prison every day and seeing him in a different way, she started to develop these feelings for him because she's looking at a grown man. She's looking at a grown man. And every now and then when he would be standing at the desk and talking to her, she felt herself becoming aroused. And it shocked her. It surprised her. It's like, what in the world is going on? So she said something to him one day. She said something to him one day. And she said, have you ever thought about, you know what I'm saying, what it would have been like if me and you would have been together and not me and Jason? And he looked at it. He said, yeah, I thought about it a few times, but, you know, that was about it. And she said, what if we had an opportunity to do that now? And he looked at it. He said, hmm, you know, because he's in the penitentiary. Let me tell you something, y'all, in the penitentiary. When you're young and in the penitentiary, you ain't turning down nothing. I'm telling you now. You ain't turning down nothing when you're young. So he looked at it. He said, I don't know what you're thinking. And she said, I don't know. She said, I'd, just, I'd like to see, though. I'd like to see what it would be like. You know what I'm saying? She said, we'd have to be careful. I wouldn't want to get fired. I, I, I need this job to take care of my daughter. But we'd have to be careful. And she said, are you willing to try? And he's like, yeah, I'm willing to try. You know what I'm saying? I'm willing to try. But at the same time, it was like, be careful. So at the end of the day, what they did was they decided that they were going to try. Now, she found a way to get the phone number on the list. And they were careful when they talked. They agreed that it wasn't going to be about no drugs or anything like that, right? So they started to talk to each other and see each other. Now, the first time that they were together, Corey could not believe how good she was and how much he had missed being with a woman. He knew that it was going to be good because he hadn't had any. He said, but she was the most passionate, sensual person that he had ever been with under those circumstances. So his mind was running wild at what it would be like if they were on the town in the bed. He says she takes her time. She's giving him head and she takes her time doing that. When she got on top of him and she's riding him, she's taking her time and she's looking him straight in his eyes and she's telling him that she's been wanting to do this for the past few weeks and how much he feels inside her. She mm -hmm. wants him to know that he fit, she, she's feeling every inch of him. She's letting him know that everything about what they're doing is right. Everything. And she tells him, she says, you know, she's on the pill. She's on the pill. But she tells him that she wants him to come inside of her. Because she wants him to know that they are together and that he can trust her. And that's what it's going to be about. So he's looking at her and he's and she's riding him and he lets loose. And when they finish and they come out, 
She's at the desk. He goes back to the room to take care of some things. He comes back down and he's talking to her. Everybody's watching. And here comes the mail lady. It's mail call. And when the mail lady comes in, she calls out Corey's name. He's got legal mail. He's got legal mail from the courts. Now, think about it. He's just been on this emotional high, just made love to this woman under the circumstance that he's in, in a way that he never imagined he would be able to do. And then they call him for legal mail. And he's excited because he's been fighting his case. But when he gets the mail and he, and, he, and, he, and he opens it and he reads that his case had been denied, his appeal had been denied. Now he goes from a high to a low, just like that. And it crushes him. But here's the thing. When he goes down mentally, she's there. And she tells him, it's going to be okay. We're going to get through this together. We're going to get through this together. But he tells her, he said, look, I need a lawyer now. I've gone as far as I can on my own. I need a lawyer. So they're sitting there talking and trying to figure out what they're going to do to get the money to get a lawyer because it's not cheap. She can't do it with the money that she's making. He's not selling drugs in prison, and he does not want to sell drugs in prison. So what do they do? As they sit there and talk for a couple of hours, right before it's time for her to go, she says something that shocks Corey to the core. She said, why don't we get the money from Jason? Corey looks at her and said, he's not going to give me any money. She said, who said anything about asking for it? She said, I know where everything's at. I know where he keeps everything. I even know the combination to the safe. And she said, I'll bet you he hasn't changed it. So now Corey's thinking, how can I pull this off? Mm. What did I say to y'all earlier about getting somebody on the streets to do something? If you get somebody on the streets or in the penitentiary to do something for you, the first thing that they're going to ask you is, how does it benefit me? Now he had a way that it would benefit those guys on the streets that he could talk to. And that's what's coming. But check this out. You're going to have to listen to the next episode to find out what's going to happen, right? <laughs> it's getting good. I told you it was a good one. This has been another episode of Doing Time with Joe. I'm your host, Joe Baker. And I say peace, y'all.